On this episode of Whistle Talk, join me, Mike D., the referee, as I sit down with head football coach of Kane University, Dan Garrett, as we discuss a college coach's take on football officiating. That's today's episode of Whistle Talk, coming up next. Are you a football fan? Have you ever found yourself wondering what in the world was that ref thinking? Well, Mike D., the referee, is here to help. Join me on Whistle Talk as I talk to professionals on the field and in the booth to help you understand what is going on inside the mind of a football official. All right, I'd like to welcome in head coach of Keene University, Mr. Dan Garrett. Uh, just a couple of quick background things. Uh, Dan and I go back uh, a real long time. Dan and I were old college roommates, college teammates, and we coached college football together for a little bit there before uh, Dan moved on and uh, is now the head coach of Keene since 2006. So let me hand it over. Dan, thank you for coming on the show today. Yeah, Mike, man. Thanks for having me. This is uh, definitely unique and different and awesome. Like you said, we go all the way back to 1993. Uh, played yeah. together, roomed together, worked worked in our, our jobs together at certain venues and, uh, <laughs> you know, coached together. So we'll just leave it at, we'll leave it at that. Absolutely. May have had a beer or two together <laughs> in, in, back in the day. <laughs> Maybe an occasional single one, yes. <laughs> So uh, for those that aren't familiar with, with Dan's background, Dan is also the all-time winning, winning as coach at Kane University, too. So uh, since 2006, the head coach, previously defensive coordinator there, previously defensive coordinator at Montclair State, where, what did you, D.C., what, 25 years old as a defensive coordinator? Yeah, Mike. I mean, we, we just were living together a couple of years before, and in 25 years old, I get handed the reins to run Coach Gina Cola's defense at Montclair State. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, good, I mean, good just time. unreal, unreal. Yeah. So now, jumping right into our interview here, so have you on a Whistle Talk tonight where we're going to kind of talk about a coach's perspective and a college coach's perspective about high school officiating or officiating in general – um, but you've had the luxury being in the position that you're in. Plus, Dan also has kids of his own that are going through the high school ranks playing football. You've seen a lot of different high school football games and football games in general. In your career, how have you seen the, the, the officiating evolved in, in, in the past to where we are today? Yeah. You know, I, th I think where we are today, we, we, you know, and you know this, uh, I think things circle, circulate and go full circle. Uh, I think that the society we live in today, it's hard to get people who want to officiate. Their love for the game is there, but people just don't want to be hassled, um, embarrassed, uh, belittled uh, for that $50 or $75 check if you're lucky. Um, so, so I know that people are certainly passionate about being official for football. But I know there's also a shortage where to the point where there's there's some college refs who work high school games on Friday nights and vice versa, because it's really hard to get the assigners to fill games. And even when you have state playoff games and, and consolation games or regular Oops. season. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is is just the shortage and, and having to rework, you know, game schedules just to fill games with referees. So, you know, it's it's challenging. So you're, you're getting people into the sport uh, and, and the career of officiating. Yeah. Um, and my thing, it, it's always, you know, there's going to be learning curves in any any profession, right? But the luxury that other jobs have is you're not on this public display, you know, like like policemen and firemen and coaches and referees. You're you're going to get lambasted, you know, and people are always going to have an opinion about you, you know. So I, I think that you know that's yeah, the challenge. No. Go ahead. Unfortunately, right now, for those that aren't aware in the state of New Jersey, there is a, a little controversy going on at the high school basketball ranks right now. Um, unfortunately, in a state semifinal game last night, it came down to uh, a last minute, a last second call that got overturned. And unfortunately, uh, a team kind of kind of lost out on a win that they that they earned and deserved and not taking anything away from from the other team both teams I mean it was a, a one point game down to the wire um, but the human element came into came into play and uh, unfortunately there's there's one school and, and one community that is is hurt by by a decision and 
I, I don't know the officials. I don't even know who the officials were that were involved in it. But uh, it, it's unfortunate because now it's a it's a big uh, big X on, on them, unfortunately. And, and right now, social media has been going wild, uh, bashing bashing these individuals, and it's unfortunate. I, I mean, the officials that I'm friends with and all the different sports we're all out there for the right reasons for the most part i mean none of us really have a skin in the game we want to officiate the game the best of our ability and let the kids have the best experience as possible so it's unfortunate but sometimes uh things do get a little crazy well so like, like you said mike talking social about media now, specifically with, with you with with the college officials and stuff like that you're starting to learn and see guys over uh, over a couple of years now getting the same different officials, seeing new officials. I was going to talk about right. you said about social media. You know, that's the problem. Yeah. Everyone's got a voice. Everyone's got a voice now and everyone's got a camera. Whereas when we were in college, right, that, that didn't exist. There was no cameras. There's no Internet. There was no social media. And, and like now everyone always thinks they're right and everyone's opinion is right. And, and that's not always the case. It's easy after the fact to. You know, when you want to land base, to, you know, whether it be an official or a coach, you know, being the moment and having to make an, uh, an average decision in that moment in time is better than making no decision at all or the best decision three weeks from now. So, you know, I think those things in society, that's the change, not so much in the officiating curve, but society has changed so much in the last 20, 30 years, which isn't a big window. But there's yeah. a lot of different technology. There's a lot of different voices. There's a lot of different editors and chiefs out there who run their own newspapers on yep. a daily basis. Yeah. And you got crazy officials that have their own podcast too. So <laughs> touche, but uh, ho hopefully we, we were able to, uh, to, to, to make that a little bit better. But uh, yeah. w with that being said, with the situation that we were just talking about with the basketball game, how do you in a football game handle possibly a controversial call? Because I'm sure not every single call has gone your way or the way that you've liked it. So h how do you, try to approach that yeah and, and like you said I, i've been doing it long enough now where, where i i normally see a lot of familiar faces you know yep. so i can go over to a guy and put my call sheet over my mouth and be like hey man can you go talk to the line judge on the other side next time because you know we're missing something here or i can go over to the line judge on my side and be like hey when you get a chance can you just go talk to the umpire like he's got to see what i'm seeing at some point like i, I you know i have eyes too and it's you know, maybe it's just a conversation like that. I mean, in all my years, Mike, you know, I had my first 15 yard flag penalty this past fall. And, and that was a combination of, you know, you know me as a player, but as a coach, I wasn't proud of that moment because nope. I usually handle it well. Like I get there's a human element. I get we don't have uh, instant replay. I understand the game moves fast. I understand that we only have seven officials, not eight, like the big time. And those even guys at the big time make mistakes and they have instant replay to correct it. So, like, I'm really, really poised to understand, like, the, the calls of the game are going to happen. And I don't always have to agree with them because I have the luxury to watch it on film on Sunday and then send it into the assigner if it's egregious. And yeah. I've only sent three or four clips in, in, in two, since 2006 when, when I thought they were actually egregious. So mm -hmm. I understand that officiating is part of the game. And, and, if, and if we do what we're supposed to do, it shouldn't change the outcome of the game potentially. Unfortunately, like we said with this instance last night, you know, you have one official saying it counted, the other official coming in overruling it, and then the luxury of having to see it, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, yeah, he was right, I was wrong, I apologize, but then once, you know, the officials leave the field or, or the officials leave the court, that game's final, and there's, there's really nothing that can be done, you yeah. know, so it's, it, it's part of the game, man, and, and I don't always have to like it, and I tell you guys that. Like, and I'm telling you, like, you know me because we, we played together and I was, I was out of my mind back then. As yeah, I can honestly young... say Danny was an intense character back in the day. So, <laughs> and, still and very I... passionate about the sport today, but definitely, uh, definitely yeah. a little bit more on the edge back then. Yeah, I'm, I definitely exude more poise now, and and I make sure I go up to guys like whether that's pregame or when they tell me, hey, about you know who's your get back coach. I'll even tell them like everybody, like including me, like we you know or we get late in the season. Hey, who's your get back coach? I'll be like, look, what's game nine? We haven't had any issues. We'll police that. No one should be talking anyway. Like those types of conversations just to build some type of rapport. But again, after 18 years being a head guy, like there's a lot of familiar faces. But the ones I don't see typically are either ones that are young and upcoming, right? Mm -hmm. And they're learning. And there is a learning curve. And then and I Absolutely. start seeing them grow and develop. But unfortunately, the, co the head coach in me, like they also have a say in my livelihood. Yes. Be because at the end of the day, I understand it's a human element. 
But I also want some other, not everyone, because there's some really good ones I've come across. But there's some, there's some other ones who just want to be seen. Man. Like, they just want to let everybody in the stadium know they're there. And I just try to go over to that guy and be like, hey, do you know, like, I, I keep my job based on wins and losses. And, like, you're, now you're impacting the game a little bit. Like, where you're throwing seven flags or eight flags in one one spot on in the, on the team here, and you're throwing eight flags. Like, we, we get it. Everyone saw you. Like, there was a game a couple years ago down at Rowan. It was the fourth quarter in a one-score game. He stops the game with, like, eight minutes left to say, hey, everyone, pull your socks up. Like, really? Like, really? This is, this is We're, we're going to do this now? On the 20-yard line going in, we're, we're going to stop the game and, and say, pull your socks up? We're, we're really doing this? Yeah, I uh, I get it. There, there's a, there's times where I like to stuff the flag a little bit deeper. I mean, my my, my motto is, is uh, and I'm in the middle of the field. I, I'm an umpire at the high school level, so everybody's seeing me out there. I like to go unseen. I I don't want to be seen unless unless I have to call it at the point of the attack. I, I want to go unseen. I, I don't want people to know my name. Uh, heck, they they announce it over the PA system. I laugh about it. I point to somebody else and say that's him. <laughs> So that's just my my personal motto, because because uh, like you, I, I've been in in the coaching shoes before, and I, I know how hard you work and and everything like that. And I want to give the best game for for all those kids and for all the coaches and all the time and effort that they're putting in. And I'm trying to put in my best effort too, because uh, if you don't know me, if you don't remember me after the game, I feel I did a good game. Uh, there are games where I've thrown six or seven flags because it's 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 had to be called. It's it's egregious or it's at the point of the attack or whatever it may be. But I'd prefer to go into a huddle and talk to a kid. And one of the biggest things I always loved emphasizing to to guys that I officiate with now is talking to the coaches, like just, Mm -hmm. just let them know and be honest with them. Hey coach, I missed that one. Or Hey coach, tell 79, keep his hand inside, whatever it may be. But opening the communications, I find that, tends to make my job a little bit easier and it helps you as a coach understand what's going on. And, and coach 79, if he keeps holding, I'm going to have to bang him for one. And now it allows you as a coach, Hey, listen, you're on your last straw. You're going to get, you're going to hurt us 10 yards, 15 yards, whatever it may be. So opening that lines of communication, I think is, is very key on, on both parts. And like 100%. what you said, going up and talking to the official and not just, screaming and yelling at the official which we we've had happen to us well again right just like some officials want to be seen right let's call it on both sides here there's some coaches who think screaming and yelling and just being seen on the sideline is their sole purpose of everyone in the stadium to see them right and 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 again like let's just also remember like every head coach i don't care high school middle school college you're mentoring and a role model for every young man on that sideline so when you act a fool, they act a fool. Yep. You keep your poise, they keep your poise. And that's why I'm I am I'm embarrassed of the one flag I got because I said some things that I couldn't take back in the moment where it was just unraveling and and like that was nineteen ninety five Dan Garrett coming out. Yeah. And as but as a head coach, you know, at eight at nineteen, twenty years old, all right, it's not acceptable, but uh, you, you know, I can I can be like, all right, that was that guy then. At, at the age now of 50 and getting that flag and saying what I said to that guy in the sideline. Okay. I'm, I'm lucky he didn't throw me out. Yeah. Uh, it, it happens. And, and it's an emotional game. I mean, there's no sugarcoating that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bunch of grown ass men going out there and, and hitting the crap out of each other for uh 40 minutes, 50 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever game level that you're playing at emotions are going to get the best of you. And and again, the, the time commitment that you guys are putting in as players, as coaches, it, it, it's understandable that sometimes your frustration gets, you, you let it out at, at the wrong time, possibly, or just a little bit overboard and understanding that it happens. Me as an official, heck, I, I've ridden officials as a coach. So I kind of have some thicker skin as an official. Now I kind of let coaches get it off their chest if they need be. And then I'll go back over to them a player or two later and say, listen, coach, we're good now. Like you've spoken your, your piece. Now, now let, let's get back to the game. Um, but what, how you're talking and how you're describing it to me as an official is a, is a fantastic perspective. I I've come to find a lot of times as an official that it's not necessarily the head coach 
but it's sometimes the the assistant coaches or even the players when the head coach doesn't see. How do you, as a program, Dan, how, how do you talk to your players or talk to your assistants about how to handle, again, same thing, it's some of their livelihoods, but so how do you yeah. address it with your coaching staff and with your players? So, I mean, we, we hit it on with the players early in preseason camp. Like we, okay. we hold a, a, an in-season meeting way before the game one and, and we talk about what we expect of them. They shouldn't be talking to referees. Now, some referees like to open that banter. And, and they like going back and forth to the guys in like a jovial way and they open that can and, and, but either way, like I tell them like, you shouldn't complain. Like, I don't want to see the, the hands in the air. Like how can you give me the call? You know, the holding during the play. Like we talk about all that. Like, we don't want to see that. Like if you, know, we just don't want to see it. And you should never talk to an official. That's the coaches. They know too, like it's, it's reiterated over and over. Like there's not a soul on the sideline other than me who should be talking to those guys. Now, if they want to talk to you, the back judge wants to talk to the secondary guy and have small talk. Awesome. If the O-line's in the back and he's talking to the, to the line judge in between. Awesome. But no one should ever say a word to them ever. And if they ever do and coat and they come over to me in the stripes and be like, Hey, talk to your coach. Like I am not, I'm the 1996, 95 Dan that comes out on the coaching staff. Uh -huh. No, because th there's an expectation there. Like you're going to uphold the standard and you're going to represent me the right way because my name's on the truck. So uh, like I will, I will get a little bit, not belligerent, but you know, a little bit shitty <laughs> with the <laughs> staff and players more so than I am with the refs. Like, you know, and, and again, I've really only gotten shitty with refs once in my, in my 18 years as a head coach. And, and, and I went right up to him after my emotions calmed down. I said, look, you don't know me. I apologize. That's not my style. You call the flag. You don't have to like me anymore. I'm just letting you know. I apologize. It's not me. But if anyone goes up on my staff and starts pitching, like I'm going over them and I'm I'm telling them STFU. Like I, that's what I'm saying. So like guys, you got the. <laughs> that's it. Like you, you, there's no reason you should be talking if you want to keep coaching here. Like because that doesn't help us. But getting on a referee from a player standpoint or or six six seven eight assistants that doesn't help our cause. No. They're humans. They're just going to get pissed off. And want to call more against your ass like so let's just stop and, and we talk about you know respecting the proud tradition of the past and we're gonna we're gonna be the class of college football and that's what we try to talk about especially on game days we don't have to like what's going on but we don't control the refs like there's three things we talk about that there's three things we don't control we can't control the opponent we can't control the weather and we can't control the calls of the referees yep and we should not be responding to any three of them right you can add fans in there and all that other shit but those three we talk about we can't control so let's not waste focus and energy on those three entities. Now, for our listeners out there that that might just be the casual fan, can you explain what what you got what you guys do uh, pregame with the officials? You guys have a pregame meeting with the officials. Do you know how far ahead of time do you know who the officials are, and do you kind of know going yeah. in like, oh, hey guys, we got to watch this guy. These guys throw a little bit, a couple more flags than uh, crew B does. So what do you do with that, that pregame talk and stuff like that? Yeah, they, they try not to give us the same crew twice in a season. Mm -hmm. and, and, and our level, you know, guys are going to get called up if they're good. They're going to go to D2. They're going to go 1AA to CAA. They're going to get called up, you know, all the way up. So we, really, we rarely get the same crew twice in one year. But we will get a lot of the same guys on the same crew over the course of the years. Yeah. So, like, I, I usually get the assigner uh, email on Monday from the referee. He'll, he'll send all the information about who's on the crew, who's the umpire, who's the line judge, who's the back judge, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then I keep a, a file of basically the names of who we've had and what I thought was good or bad. And even then, like after a game, not to jump ahead, but after the game, like part of our ECFOA, there's there's like a rating you're supposed to do as a head coach. So okay. like after, after every game, I rate the officials and, and very rarely, like it's a one through five rating. Five is good. You know, one is terrible, and if you give a rating of three or below, you got to give a reason why. Okay, and I can literally, I can literally count on on two hands in all the years that I've wrote um, something about an official who was a three or lower, and and that's like you know be, because of my perspective. You know, I, I yeah. understand whether they're younger and they're learning. I understand that there's a human element. They've the luxury of special. Reason. I understand. Hey, during the game, he told me, Coach, I didn't see it. You know, yep. so like that conversation again. So like Mondays we get the assigners uh, and like the pregame meeting, the pregame meeting is always interesting because some guys are a lot more detailed than others. Uh, and in that meeting, you know, we basically outline, you know, they ask for team captains, numbers, et cetera, right handed, right handed quarterbacks, right handed kickers or lefties, whatever. Um, the state, the umpire usually asks who the center is and what his name is. Uh, and then we talk about any specialties 
um, that we have for the week, whether it's an offensive trick play on special teams, we have any yep. surprise on site kicks, fake punts, et cetera, or anything that we might be doing that might catch them off guard. And, and me personally, I even give them like the code names if we're, we have a fake punt in. So like if they hear the name getting called out by the, the, the personal protector, that gives them a heads up. You know, and, and I could tell them even like the code name from the sideline for a surprise onside kick out of the huddle. Okay. What what to listen for because I don't want them missing it. Yeah. I, I don't want them to say I didn't see it. Right. So so all those things I'm trying to give as much information as I can. And there's been years in the past where I've actually had diagrams and drawn it up for them, and I can't give it to them, but I want to show them it because if there's a wacky shift or we, we're doing something crazy with our punt team to try and get a fake, where we're moving the left side of the line over to the right side. I want to make sure they know. Hey, look. The left side of the line, the guard to tackle them, they're not on. They're off the yep. ball. The personal protector is going to make a call. They're all going to shift to the right. They're going to step on. That makes the long snapper eligible, right? So, like, those things, like, it's a very intricate, depending week to week what you have, it's either very intricate and involved or, hey, like, this week, guys, we're, we're just throwing a bubble, man. It's not meant to be thrown behind the line of scrimmage. It's meant to be thrown forward. It's not going to be lateral. Yep. That's all we got this week, you know? So, it's really – it depends on week to week, but those are the things that we cover and we discuss with the, the – usually the – the officials being the umpire and the referee, and if yep. there's, you know, unfortunately, if then and if there's a uh, someone there grading them, which is always a bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> like if their if their people are in the stands, they're and I'm like, oh boy, it's gonna be one of them days. Yeah, and so the listeners know. So me being an umpire, I'm also a referee too. Um, so I'm involved in these conversations a lot with the coaches. It's our job now to go back. We have a pregame crew meeting. So after after both teams leave the field, we go back into a locker room, whatever it may be, and we sit down and we go over the and I explain who the captains are and say, okay, uh, Coach Garrett mentioned that they have this trick play in, so let's be aware of that. Um, they a, a double pass, for example, which is one of the hardest plays for us to to judge if it's a backwards pass or a forward pass, just because of our mechanic on it and. We've gone back and forth as an association on that mechanic, but just making sure, say, hey, just keep an eye out. If you see that pass kind of look like it's going down the line of scrimmage, just make sure you got a good angle on it because they do have a, a double pass with it. So, and technically it's not a double pass because it's a backwards pass. So it's a, it's misnamed, but different things like that really do help us out as officials so that, like you're saying, we don't miss that because there are, and especially with the younger games and different things like that, you get a lot of different trick plays, especially at the JV level where you got coaches basically drawing in the sand, uh, go up to the manhole cover, make a left, I'm going to hit you. And they're running every trick play that they saw on TV and in a movie at you. Um, so they, they kind of get a little bit upset at times if you miss that call. But it does definitely help us out as officials having that open line of communication. And unfortunately, then we also get coaches that, Hey, coach, anything you want us to look out for? No, nah, nah, just straight football, straight football. And all of a sudden they come out and they're running a swinging gate down the whole length of the field and catches us off guard. And now we're trying to check for eligible numbers and ineligibles and different things like that. So it definitely, for, for all the coaches out there that may be listening, be honest with the referees. Because I could tell you, we're not going and telling the other team, hey, watch out for this trick play. Uh, I mean, we're out there to try to call the best game for everybody. So the more information you can give us, the better it is for both sides. Yeah. And, and Mike, I, I even try to go like, if we see something on film via scout, and if it's not like a one-time thing on a film, but like if it's showing itself over and over on a three or four game scout, like, Hey man, the, the garden center on their zone are, are, are high low in every game. Like yep. they're, they're legal chop blocking. Like I'm going to bring that up too. Absolutely. There's a legal crack box coming from the slot. That's, that's ear holing the Mike backer. Like nowadays you can't do that. I'll be like, hey, they've shown it enough where I'm bringing it up to your attention. Or the one that we see a lot of in today's spread offense is, hey, they're throwing the ball downfield, but the other receiver's blocking while the quarterback is still throwing the ball. Yep. And the ball is in his hand. It's not in the area, and he's blocking because it's illegal. You can't block. You know, it's offensive, the ball's in the offensive air. interference, yep. And, and it never gets called. But, I mean, those are conversations I'm also bringing up. Like if it's on film from the opponent, I'm also yep. bringing it to their attention as well. Yeah, the RPO game has definitely brought in a, a whole new nuance to officiating the game with just uh, is a lineman downfield, are they blocking downfield, different things like that. So it's definitely something that if we find out per pregame that, hey, okay, this is an RPO heavy team, because now us as officials, we don't get pregame film. We get film after the game so we can go back and we can critique what we did 
uh, with that game, but I'm not going in knowing that, hey, this team is a spread team or this team's an option team or they're going to run power and zone. So we, we don't have that background knowledge per se. Now, most of the coaches, we kind of get a get a feel for. We've seen enough, so we kind of understand what they're doing. But still, you get a, get a newer coach. We don't have that knowledge. So getting that pregame from the coaches is definitely very helpful for all of us. Mm. So keep doing that, coach. Keep doing that. So now, Dan, here's where I get to throw you under the bus just a little bit now. It's it's time for my new segment, my quiz. You get to be the uh, the first coach that I get to test out in this. So I'm going to share my screen here. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. I know Coach Garrett right now is uh, is utilizing his cell phone, but got a little presentation here for him. Oh, yeah, it's coming up. Oh, yeah, look at you. There we go. Flag facts. All right, we'll so we got our flagged facts, our, our whistle talk rule quiz. So today, I got I only got two questions for Dan because, like I said, he's he's my old roommate. I don't I don't want to do wrong by him. So we only we only got two questions for him. Where I want to try to keep it as three questions in, in the future. But so here we go with, with, with question number one. All right, so we got a punt here. So K, it's fourth and ten at K's thirty yard line. K's scrimmage kick, also known as a punt, is blocked at the K-20, so behind the line of scrimmage. And the kicker, K-9, picks up the ball there and runs. He gets to the K-42 where he is tackled. Dan, what do you think we got on this play? Is this a legal play? We not only have a legal play, we have a first down, and the offense is coming back on the field, Big Mike. Absolutely. Here we go. Let's give give Dan a little... A little clap. Let me applause, Mike. Give me the applause. Where you guys got to have something. Pull it up for me. <laughs> and I'm the one on the phone. Me. And I'm the one on the phone. <laughs> technology got the better of me on that one. Right, here we go. Right now. Right on. Okay, you definitely go. got right that on. one. Right, can, at worst, I could be 50-50 now. Well, hold, hold off on that one. Now, like I said, I, I, I'm trying to be nice to Dan. So there you go. There's the result of the play. You got K first and 10 at the 42-yard line where he got tackled. Yes. All right. Here comes question number two. Like I said, hold off on your 50-50 because question number two, <laughs> it's a three-part question. Nice. <laughs> but it's technically only two questions, though, so I wasn't lying to you. You're not lying. <laughs> so here we go. A, first and 10 at the 50-yard line. A, 34, takes a handoff and runs to the B, 45, where he's tackled inbounds during the play. So during the play, A, A, 78, blocks below the waist at the A, 47. So where do you think we're going with this one here, Dan? Block below the waist, you're bringing it back 15 yards. It is a 15-yard penalty. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Where are we where are we going to enforce that one from now? So now that, mm-hmm. we started that, at the fifty yard line. He got he basically gained five yards to the forty five yard line, but this block happened below the waist behind the line of scrimmage at the A forty seven. So where do you think we'll enforce this from? Fifteen yards from the forty seven. All right. So this is where Dan's going to be happy if he was the one getting called against this. This penalty is actually going to go from the previous spot. So it's going to be 15 uh, yards from the 50-yard line. So nice. the high school rules this past year changed it. Um, it was more so because of the holding penalties, where the holding penalties tended to be spot fouls. So if, if an offensive lineman got caught holding on a pass play and he was four yards behind the line of scrimmage, it ended up being a 14-yard penalty. So to kind of align everything with the college and the, and the NFL rules, we're going, if it's behind the line of scrimmage and behind the run, we're going to go from the previous spot. So in this scenario, we would go 15 yards from the 50. So it would be first and 25 from A's 35-yard line. Amen. So same scenario, same play happens, but instead of the block below the waist, we now have a A holding penalty, A64 holds at the B43. So now this penalty happens – uh, seven yards downfield. Mm. So where are we going to enforce this one from? So now you're going to go, if you gain five yards, you're bringing it back 10 from, now that's that's a spot foul, Mike. You can't be messing with me here, right? The spot foul happens seven yards downfield. Yes, first and 13, correct. You first picked up 13. five yards. Yeah, first and 13 from the spot foul. 
Yes, sir. So first and 13 from the 47, as coach said, going from that spot. All right, our last one. We have a block in the back, now downfield by wide receiver, blocks in the back at the 40-yard line. So we started at the 50, ball carrier got five yards, got to the 45, receiver was another five yards downfield, block in the back. Where are we enforcing this penalty from? Definitely spot foul as well, right? 10 yards from the spot. So we're bringing it back 10 yards back to the 30-yard line, right? Spot foul. The ball, the, the spot foul happened at the 40, correct? Because I'm on my phone. <clears throat> so it, hap it happened on the defensive 40. So they gained only five yards. So the 50-yard line. So got into beast territory. So that's the 40-yard line here. So this was mm -hmm. further downfield from where the end of the run was. Further downfield. Correct. Sure. So sure. this one would actually come from the end of the run in this scenario. Yeah, so because yeah. the block happened basically 10 yards beyond the, the, the line of scrimmage, we're going to go from the end of the run. So it's going to be first and 15 from now the A's, A's 45-yard line. So it's just going to go back. So in essence, you're only losing five yards instead of the – because if it was the spot foul, you would have first and 10 again in that scenario. Yeah, gotcha. All oh, right. Yeah. So, even the old dog can learn new tricks. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, that's the thing, man. That's why I'm always talking to those guys on the sideline. I want to know what they're going through during the game. I want to hear it. So, let's see. Oh, now, now the clap will work for you. There we go. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, for taking part in our little quiz game there, Danny. So, uh, yeah, for Mike. the listeners, we're going we're gonna to keep going with that and, and quizzing everybody that we have on there. So, we're even going to have a – an episode where it's just going to be questions and quizzes for people. So, so Dan, I, I appreciate you taking the time out. I know your busy schedule. So let's start, start wrapping this up really quick. What feel like, like what is your opinion on the importance of officials on player development? What kind of influence do we have as officials as uh, that the players see and, and possibly helping them in their development? Because I mean, we're all of us are dealing with young men and women that we're trying to – what percentage of people do you have, Dan, that have gone to the NFL? Uh, uh, zero. We had one make it to a camp, um, and he had a cup of tea with them, but one in all my years since I've been there in 2003. So yeah. a a as a coach and a as an official, would you think that we have some type of uh, process in, in how these people may turn out to be uh, in their other professional careers that they go for? I mean, I would like to think so, Mike. I mean, that's why I'm, I am doing what I'm doing. I like to think we all make a difference in that in their lives, uh, whether that, that is through football, through the game, through the teachings, through the mentoring, or all the above. I, I think every one of us who comes in contact with these young people have an opportunity and responsibility to mentor and lead them and kind of show them the right way. So whether it's a coach or an official, right, it's about how we respond to the circumstances we don't create. And when we act Correct. a fool... We're not really we're not really giving them the tools for their toolbox to be successful because they're seeing behaviors that are, are, are more acceptable now than ever in, in society versus, you know, poise and take a step back, hit pause and, and think about before you open your mouth. I think we all have a responsibility to that. And I think both, especially when we're specifically talking football on the one game a week in that, that 45 or 60 minute game, whether high school or college. You know, I, I think it, it comes down to the mutual respect that the officials and the coaches and the players should all have for one another. And I think the more we can to, can exemplify that, you know, officials to players, players to officials, coaches to players, coaches to officials, and vice versa, officials to coaches, I think that's that's where that happens. Like you said, hey, 79, stop holding. You keep holding, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it on you. Hey, coach, I keep telling 79, I'm going to have to hit him with him, I have to bang him. Like that's like, that's life, right? It's not what you know, sometimes it's who you know. And, and yeah. you know, at, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about relationships. We're talking about an opportunity for a 45 minute or 60 minute game to develop a relationship that might last well past that 45 or 60 minute game that had an impact on that young man. So I think we all have a piece in this. You know, I think the game itself, um, this game has given so much, I know to me, I know it's given so much to you. Uh, my main thing at this stage in my life is I want to get back to that game, whether that's, you know, talking to youth football coaches or, you know, just continually to to to, to speak and, and give a message to my own players that they can bring into their personal lives as as fathers down the road or in their, in their professional careers. You know, this this thing, this football thing has given me everything to, to this point in my life. 
that provide yeah. for not only me and my family. So uh, I am indebted to this game. I am grateful and so blessed to be where I am uh, and where us all started back in, you know, from Clifton High School to Montclair State, you know, to the people I surrounded myself uh, self with, guys like you, Jermaine, John Fury, Billy Johnson, Richie Nicola, Rich O'Connor. I mean, we can go on and on with the names. Yeah, but absolutely. We all pulled from them and, and we watched and learned and they mentored us and, and they didn't know how valuable of a lesson they were teaching us. You know, we, we had some different personalities now. You know, we talk about Coach O versus a Coach G. You know, I, I tell each one of them, though, how important they were in my life to this day and how much I still pull from their teachings back when I sat in, you know, the, the meeting rooms in camp to where I am today. Like, and that's what we all have. We all have a responsibility through this great game of football to really make sure these younger people, through social media, through societal norms, like the world can learn a lot from a football locker room and a football game. You know, you can take all walks of life, all colors, races, religions, socioeconomic, demographic, and, and it just all comes to a stop when you're on a football team. It's Absolutely. all about a fraternity and brotherhood. And that fraternity includes officials. You know, it's part of the game. And there's a human element. And I understand that from jump. And I think that's why there's a mutual respect from 99.9% .9 of the staffs and crews I ever get on a Saturday. Yep. No, it's why, uh, my opinion, and I, I've said this before, football is the greatest team sport out there because of the lessons that, that we all can learn and the humility that it brings to all of us and, and to humble everybody every now and again, uh, no matter how great or, or how how much they think they're great. It's a humbling game, and, and it brings us all back to, to the real world. And like you said, all walks of life. It doesn't matter who you are, color, gender, anything, okay? You got to step out onto that field. You're all there for the same reason. You know? Amen, man. Absolutely. And you're, and you're right. Like this game, it'll humble you in a second. And, and because like the humility is like you all need each other. I don't care what role you play in football. You could be a seven string defensive end. Like that scout team needs to perform during the week to make that first and second team better. And vice versa. Like, so, I mean, there's so many lessons to be pulled and, and it's just a shame because we're growing up now and not us. We're growing up with our kids are growing up in a society where, you know, the transfer portal is an acceptable norm. It's okay to, to not be loyal to the people who are loyal to you. And it's it's okay to jump ship where, you know, or, uh, it's not self-serving for me instead of working at it and staying and staying accepting your role and excelling at your role. Like, you know, these are all things that were like mainstays when we played high school and yes, college sir. football. Like teammates, loyalty, trust, development. You know, it's, you know, unfortunately, not everybody. And we're, we're, you know, we're lumping it in just because where we are and what we're talking about that's a norm now. Like it's okay to go shop yourself around if you're not happy. And you know, that's not the game that we grew up in. Yep. No, hundred percent. So one last question for you, bud. Yeah. Any newer person that's out there that may think about or be inspired by this and maybe wanting to become a football official, what kind of advice would you give to them as, as they approach this, this profession or, or tips or recommendations yeah. that you can give to them? You know, just like coaching, man, don't make yourself bigger than the game. No one's bigger than the game. You know, work within the parameters of the game. Know your role in the game. You know, the mechanics of the game. Try to perfect your craft, whether that, that is, you know, what if you're an umpire, know the mechanics inside and out and, and just perfect your eyes, right? Don't become a spectator or a fan of the game if you're going to choose this. You know, really learn and study the mechanics and get around people who know it and learn from people who've been there just the way coaches do, right? You go out to clinics, you spend time. You know, I live around the corner. I love going to those guys at Monmouth, you know, because they're they're really good and you can learn from them still at my age. So, like, just never stop learning and surround yourself with good people. And just if you're going to do it, just don't put yourself – no one is bigger than the game. It doesn't matter, coach, player, official. You know, this game has, has been around for so long, and it's it's one of the – you know, obviously I think it's the greatest game on the planet for so many reasons. Like Mike said, the teamwork. You need 11 people acting as one. You need, you need 50, 60 people with one heartbeat to, to really be successful. Absolutely. You know, that's, that synergy, that cohesion is the same as a team, as your crew. Like, you know, and if you're, if you're able to get on a crew and you can stay with a crew for a year or two, awesome. But then when you go to a different crew, developing that synergy so you know, like, you know, okay, I see it and you see it and you give a hand gesture, like, that matters. Like, yeah. those things matter, you know, to get to know the guys you're working with and, and be comfortable. Like, those are all things that I think are, are great in coaching and officiating. Work at it, perfect it, and, and just never make yourself bigger than the game. Absolutely. Dan, once again, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to jump on here with us tonight. Um, everybody else out there, 
Dan Garrett, Kane University. Go catch one of his games. Union, New Jersey, if you're in the area, part of the NJAC, one of the one of the hardest uh, Division Three conferences in the, in the whole country. Great football. I don't care what level you think it is. You're playing college football. You're doing something right. Go out, catch one of his games. Dan, again, appreciate it. Love you, brother. Love and you, man. Let's keep in touch. Absolutely, Mike. Thanks for having me, dude. This was the best 40 minutes of my day right now, catching up with you <laughs> and, and, and getting my, my three my three prong question attack on me. So thank you so much, dude. You're the best. Love you. Thanks, brother. You're uh, always, always. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Whistle Talk, where we unravel the fascinating world of football officiating. If you enjoyed today's discussion and want to stay in the loop with the latest insights, be sure to subscribe to Whistle Talk on your favorite podcast platform. Stay connected with us by following Whistle Talk on social media, where we share behind the scenes glimpses, updates, and engage with our incredible community of officiating enthusiasts. Find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Just search for the words Whistle Talk. Your support means the world to the show, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, questions, or suggestions for future episodes. Drop us a line through our website or message me on social media. I'm always eager to connect with the fellow fans and continue the conversation. Until next time, keep blowing the whistle on the untold stories and nuances of football officiating. Thanks for being part of the Whistle Talk family. This is Mike D., the referee, saying so long for now.